All right. Thank you all very much. Thank you. I have this book. Uh, it's not in the bookstore, but I have a box of them if you want to buy it. <laughs> Who Killed the Constitution? Now, um, I just discovered just before coming up here that the answer to this is quite simple. It was Roderick Long who killed the Constitution. <laughs> he came up to me and said, Tom, I have a confession to make. I was just trying to scare it a little bit, you know, and it was, it was, it was an accident. I have a daughter who's five. We have three, three little girls, uh, and the eldest daughter is five. So she's old enough to read the title, Who Killed the Constitution, but not old enough to possibly be able to understand what that would mean. So she's always asking me now, in a very grave-sounding voice, Daddy, who killed the Constitution? <laughs> and she, she's listened to my conversations with my wife enough that she's starting to sort of put two and two together, and I promise you I'm not making this up. The other day she said, was it John McCain? <laughs> She's so advanced, you know, and so I had to explain, well, no, see, now I have to explain to you what an accessory after the fact is, and that's just too complicated. Well, anyway, for those of you who want to know why we should even care about the crummy Constitution, I am going to answer that question, but I'll just start off by letting you all know that 15 years ago, I was at the Mises University as a junior in college. And if you go upstairs and you look in one of the Carters up there, you will see the group photos. We all took those group photos every year, and they're up there. You can look back to 1993 and see if you can pick me out. I'm the one guy who has still got an 80s haircut in 1993. <laughs> and in fact, if any of you are Facebook friends of mine, let's hear it. Any people of my Facebook friends? Come on. All right, that's good. Okay, smattering of applause. All right. Well, add me. Add me to, to your list. But anyway, I'm on there as Tom Woods, by the way. Don't look for Thomas Woods. There are a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, copycats on there. But if, you, but if you look at one of my photo albums on Facebook, the cover photo is me standing with a you-know-what-eating grin next to Murray Rothbard from 1993 and with that 80s haircut there, you know, grinning like a sap. But I remember getting to talk to him, and it was so enjoyable. He was, you know, he, uh, he was legendary for staying out late, always being the last one to, to go to bed, and, and being very generous with his time. And not for a moment did you ever get the sense, talking to him, that he was thinking to himself, you know, don't you know who I am? I'm Murray freaking Rothbard. You know, <laughs> what are you bothering me for? And it was none of that. You know, he was an extreme gentleman, an extremely good, good guy. And so, and then I, I met him on another occasion after that at another conference. So by 94, I actually went to Mises U a second time. And I'm standing there talking, getting to know some people. Rothbard walks in, walks right over to me and says, Oh, hi, Tom. And I just stood there thinking, eat your hearts out, people. Come on. <laughs> this is a beauty. So anyway, enjoy it. We had a great, I had such a great time at Mises U. It was absolutely fantastic. Wonderful and um, last night, some of you got to see one of the faculty members doing karaoke. If any of you went to the Sky Bar, okay? That was, that was Bob Murphy, okay? And maybe we'll persuade him to do it again at another place tomorrow night. So stay tuned, you know, get in touch with all the cool people so you'll know what's going on around, around here. I don't know where this rumor got started that uh, last year at Mises U that I did a keg stand. I don't know where that's... I don't know how that got spread. Oh, wait, no, that, I think it's because it actually happened. That's maybe where the... And that was, again, because of Bob Murphy, because he did, he did one, and then I thought, I'm not going to let freaking Bob Murphy upstage me at this thing. So then I did one, and, of course, those of us, probably perhaps some Europeans in the back saying, what, what is keg stand? Well, you can find this, out, find this out later. I don't want to tell you. I'm too embarrassed to tell you. But as I was doing it, and I realized, okay, I've already gone longer than Murphy, then I basically signaled I wanted to get down. I'm not looking to set the world's record here. I just want to show up, show up Bob Murphy. So maybe I'll do that, but I'm not singing, okay? That is not going to happen. Bob is there for that. I don't know who said that. That was a terrible thing to say. That hurts my feelings. All right, so tonight um, the subject is who killed the Constitution. This is an, a, a subject that's been of interest to me. Because I've written a lot about American history. That's my main field. 
I write about a lot of subjects because I, I have a short attention span, basically, but American history has been the focus of a lot of my work, and it's the field of my PhD. So when I did my previous two American history books, which is, uh, Jeff mentioned the, the book, 33 Questions About American History You're Not Supposed to Ask, and then before that, The Politically Incorrect Guide to American History, I did those sort of having in mind myself as an 18-year-old and thinking, what would have saved me hours and hours and hours and hours of frustration? Like, what information do I wish I had known? I, do I wish somebody had just told me about when I was 18? And I just put all this in those, those two books so that so to save you agony and frustration, you know, so that when you're hearing stuff in your classroom about, uh, well, you know, without the government, everybody would probably be scraping around, you know, barely surviving and earning three cents a day. And thanks to the government, you know, we're, we're doing as well as we are. And you hear this all the time. You think, I, you know, that, this just sounds like propaganda to me. You know, this can't possibly be right. Well, you know, okay, so I put together sort of some of the answers to these things. And so that was really satisfying to me, to finally to be able to do this and thinking, you know, that if I'd had this 16 years ago, I could have saved myself. Oh, wait a minute. No, now I'm, I'm turning 36. Oh, so 18 years ago. Gosh, I just missed two years of my whole life there somehow. <laughs> well, in any event, so I, I, I've, a, lot of the, a lot of what I've done, though, has had something to do with the Constitution. And when you talk about the Constitution in libertarian circles, I don't mean to assume that people are libertarians. You could be an Austrian without being a libertarian, I suppose. But nevertheless, <laughs> okay, it's a rare thing, I suppose. But, but nevertheless, um, you know, in, in libertarian circles, people are, are usually suspicious. Like, well, you know, why do you care about the Constitution? I mean, all you care about is liberty. You know, the Constitution is, is uh, uh, you know, is ultimately unimportant compared to the, the subject of liberty, really. So who even cares about the Constitution? And to a certain extent, that's all well and good. And I, I, I share that view uh, uh, very, very much. And in fact... The most radical expression of that view comes from our good friend, Lysander Spooner. Thank you, Max Raskin. <laughs> Mr. Brownie Points in the front. <laughs> That's right. Lysander Spooner, uh, with his, uh, his book, um, uh, No Treason, The Constitution of No Authority, in effect makes the argument that given that I, as an individual, I never signed any document indicating I'm going to follow the Constitution. No one ever got my consent to this. So in what way can it possibly be binding on me or anybody else who's alive right now? And, you know, at first, you, you know, maybe the first time you hear that, it's, it's really shocking and radical. But in fact, when you think about it, it's, there's a certain sense to that. There's no other aspect of life in which we would accept this principle for one second, that a group of people hundreds of years ago signed some document, you know, or, or they, they ratified some document, so you're stuck with it, man. I mean, like this... There's no other aspect of life in which you would accept that. So I do, I do like Spooner, and I, and I, I, I really don't see there's any way to answer his, his argument. And what impresses me, one of the zillion things that impresses me about my wife, is that without having read Spooner, one day I was talking to her about the Constitution, and she simply said, well, so what about this Constitution? Like, why is it binding on anybody? You know, like, wh I thought, oh my gosh, it's like... You're, you've got the brain of Spooner. You haven't even read him. This is great. Oh, my gosh. So once again, it's been confirmed, you know, a zillion times over that this is the woman I needed to marry. Okay. Unbelievable. Sure, she doesn't like Italian food, but why everybody has one flaw, right? Everybody has one, one deviation. That was Murray Rothbard saying, by the way. Everybody's entitled to one deviation, so... That's it. She can't do anything else after that. So why do I write about the Constitution? Then? Well, for two ma main reasons. One is, I, I think it's useful to use the Constitution as a bludgeon against the federal government, just to be able to say, look, they don't even follow their own crummy words. I mean, that's kind of interesting to note that, you know, to show that they're even worse than you think. I mean, not only are they killing people, but, you know, they don't even follow their own crummy thing that they force everybody to, uh, to learn about. In fact... I was on uh, some show a few years ago, and one of the hosts, the conservative, uh, said how wonderful it was that Senator William Byrd of, uh, pardon me, Robert Byrd, William Byrd is the old uh, uh, Virginian, the 17th century, uh, that's my historian brain at work there, but Senator Robert Byrd had introduced this measure saying every September, I don't know, 12th or something, all school children in the country are going to study the Constitution. And this, con this, this conservative host thought that was wonderful, and I thought, isn't this, isn't this unbelievable? You know, the, the conservative thinks it's wonderful 
that the federal government is unconstitutionally forcing people to learn about the Constitution. <laughs> the Constitution gives them no authority to tell school systems what they're going to teach on what day. So I thought, uh, anyway. So they don't even follow their own words. I think that's a useful proselytizing point. But secondly, for me, it's interesting to, to see how it is that you come up with these parchment limitations on government power, these constitutions. It's interesting to me to see how they wiggle out of it. Every attempt to restrain their power winds up somehow increasing it. This is a fascinating phenomenon. How do they wiggle out of this when the federal constitution limits the power of, of Congress to just a few powers? How do they get out of that? It's, it's fascinating. You just cannot contain this institution. And so that, I think, is useful in order to reach people who are sort of old-fashioned constitutional conservatives, as I used to be, to show them that this instrument that you're using to restrain this institution can't possibly work. And here are examples of it not working. And it's also worth noting, by the way, of course, that the same institution that the Constitution is supposed to restrain gets to interpret that Constitution. Well, so what do you think is going to happen? You think they're going to say, well, you know, we sure would love to draft you people into the army, but the Constitution doesn't let us do that. I mean, what are the chances they're going to do that? I mean, of course they won't. They'll just interpret it in their own favor if they have a monopoly on interpreting it. So we have that problem uh, with, with constitutions. There's no way to keep them limited because the government itself is the interpreter. And secondly, the government itself typically is the one educating you. It's also, it's, most of the time, it's some government institution. So when you read in your government-approved textbook, you don't usually see, here's where they unconstitutionally started drafting people, and here's where they unconstitutionally started banning all these substances. And he, somehow that just doesn't show up. Instead, you're taught that one of the virtues of the American system is how flexible it is, that the government can come up with all new things to do all the time, and <laughs> it's, not, it's not bound by anything. I mean, honestly, that, you're, you're taught that. Isn't it wonderful? that Supreme Court judges can just invent new things the government can do. In fact, when the subject of conscription came up before the court, the one time uh, that you actually get some kind of attempt to, uh, to speak about this, we have uh, uh, Justice Taney wrote, wrote about uh, conscription, but then the selective draft law cases in 1919 were very interesting. When the subject came up of, is the draft constitutional, the answer that was given was, not even to really look at any arguments, but to say, well, yes, of course it is. I mean, the United States is a sovereign power. Sovereign powers can draft their people. I mean, that's the whole argument. And in fact, one of the footnotes in the, in the decision said, look at all the countries in the world that conscript their citizens. You've got the empire of Germany, the empire of Japan, the empire of Russia, and they just go all down all this list saying, you know, so what are you saying? I mean, is the, is the U.S. just going to be one of them loser countries that doesn't <laughs> draft its people? I mean, that was the argument. It's actually in there. Look at all these countries that do it. All the cool countries are doing it. <laughs> so there's no, you know, there's no real attempt to, to, to actually reckon with the serious issues at stake. Any of you who haven't read Daniel Webster, who was a senator from Massachusetts, uh, his speech on conscription, which he gave in 1814 in D.C., uh, he was a, a congressman and later a senator, you really owe it to yourself to read this thing. It's absolutely fantastic. I mean, it's not just a constitutional argument. It's also an argument about the tyranny involved in the institution of conscription. And that, that speech has been reprinted. It was reprinted in the New Individualist Review. Ron Paul quoted copiously from it in his book, Freedom Under Siege, uh, and then later in, in, uh, in, his, in his latest book. It, it's just a, it's a great libertarian classic. It's an absolutely fantastic speech in which he demolished the, the, the case for, for conscription. But if the federal government wants to do it, it just does it. Now, it's interesting to note that the American Revolution is fought, by and large, over the principle of self-government. The colonial legislatures wanted to be able to govern themselves on matters pertaining to their own affairs without the undue interference of the British government. And so, after independence, and when the Constitution was being drafted, many Americans insisted not simply on a Bill of Rights in general, but specifically on a provision that would make clear that the federal government possesses only those powers that have been expressly delegated to it. It's not an unlimited national legislature. It is a federal legislature uh, with limited powers. And so we got what became the Tenth Amendment. 
And the Tenth Amendment, of course, says that the federal government possesses all those powers that the states have not delegated, uh, uh, that the states have delegated to, but only those powers. The states retain for themselves all powers not delegated to the federal government. Uh, the states or the people retain the powers in question. And Thomas Jefferson said this is the cornerstone of the whole Constitution. It keeps the federal government limited. And yet, if you were to take the bar exam today, let's say, and you're, you're going to one of these cram courses to prepare for the bar exam at the last minute, and they're giving you test-taking tips about the multiple choice section. My co-author, Kevin Gutzman, who is both a, a history PhD and a JD, tells me that at those sessions, they tell you that if one of the multiple choice answers is the Tenth Amendment, you know that's wrong. That's never right. So you can automatically just cross that out. <laughs> now, this is the cornerstone of the Constitution, and it's just out. Acor according to our legal establishment, it's not, even, it's not even there anymore. Well, so that's just well, how did you know? How did this happen? Well, this is, again, this is a limitation of Constitution. There's no way to stop this. There is no way to stop this. The Constitution does not grow fangs and attack you if you violate it. There's no way to stop this from happening. There's the fact that in the 1990s, Bill Clinton's Solicitor General, and I, I feel bad attacking Bill Clinton these days, you know, I mean, what a paradise we had by comparison. <laughs> but anyway, you know, they're all the same crummy bunch, so it's not too bad. I'm not going to weep too much about attacking him, but in the 1990s, Bill Clinton's Solicitor General was asked, can you name just one area of American life that, in your view, the Constitution absolutely forbids the federal government to involve itself in, and the guy just stood there stupefied that the question had been asked. Of course, he had no answer. There is no answer. No answer whatsoever. There is a, a, supposed to be an interpretive difference in how the federal government and the states are treated in the Constitution. What I mean by that is, the other day I got an email from somebody asking, uh, he had been reading Ron Paul's book and said, now, Ron Paul seems to suggest that the federal government is prohibited from issuing so-called bills of credit which more or less actually correspond to what we would understand as fiat money. And he said, but I looked at the Constitution, and it doesn't prohibit the federal government from issuing bills of credit. It prohibits the states from doing so. So do you think that this is a, 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 a flaw in the Constitution? And I said, actually, no, it isn't, because in the Constitution, yes, the states are prohibited from doing certain things. But the understanding is the federal government has only those powers the states delegate to it. So the federal government only has a power if it is expressly stated. If it's not expressly stated, then the states retain that power. So the mere fact that the federal government is not authorized to emit bills of credit itself suffices to prohibit it from doing so. But has it prohibited it from doing so? I mean, uh, so. The questions answer themselves. By the late 1930s, we got this beauty. We got the Caroline Products decision, which contains in it footnote number four. And in case you're thinking, my gosh, this guy's some kind of freaking genius. He knows a footnote from a Supreme Court case. But footnote four of the Caroline Products case is so well known, it's simply referred to as footnote four. <laughs> footnote four says that everything the federal government does is presumed to be constitutional. <laughs> which seems like an awful lot of weight for one footnote to bear, right? <laughs> and I'll get back to that in a minute, because it does, it does then later go on to say, well, you know, okay, you could find something unconstitutional, but here are the hoops you have to jump through to prove that. I'll get back to that in a minute. But it just goes to show that all these attempts to limit the power of government have just been effortlessly brushed aside. Now, Jefferson thought, ultimately, that it was the people whose responsibility it is to uphold the Constitution. But, you know, I read not long ago a headline that said over half of Americans are on the dole in one form or another. Over half of Americans are get, getting some kind of goodies. So if you say to them, hey, we need, to, we need to have a limited government, you know, under the Constitution, they'll just say, you know, take a hike, pal. I want my, my loot. So even the people become corrupted. So who's going to enforce the thing? It seems like it just can't be done. So one thing that we, one of the points we focus on and that I focus on in some of my writing is uh, the hilarious jurisprudence of the Commerce Clause. Now there's a clause in the Constitution about regulating interstate commerce, commerce going from one state to another. Now James Madison said that this clause 
is not really intended to give the federal government a positive power. It's really a negative power. That is, the, it, it, it empowers the federal government to strike things down that inhibit the freedom of commerce, barriers to commerce, obstacles, for example, tariffs that one state might erect against other states' products, that sort of thing. But by the early 19th century, with the evil John Marshall, uh, John Marshall is Chief Justice of the United States from 1801 to 1835, who is falsely held up as a hero by many libertarians. He's a scoundrel, he's a disgusting human being who should be <laughs> respected by nobody. But that's a whole other matter, we'll talk about that later. But John Marshall began to argue that no, 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 actually the Commerce Clause is far more expansive than we dreamed. That in fact the Commerce Clause can authorize the federal government to regulate anything that takes place in a state that might have an effect on another state. Well, you know, as Jefferson said, look, in, in some fundamental, you know, looking at, at things, you know, sub specie aeternitatis, everything affects everything else. So this, in effect, is giving us an unlimited government. And that's, in fact, what's happened. Now, in the 20th century, that was changed so that now it has to have a substantial effect on another state, and then they can regulate it. But well, take for example, this is my favorite example, many of you have probably heard of this case. In 1942, we got this Wickard versus Filburn Supreme Court case involving a farmer who had grown wheat for his own use to consume or to feed to his livestock on his own farm. And the federal government was trying to regulate how much he was allowed to grow. And he said, well, you know, forget that. How can you regulate that? I mean, this is not interstate commerce. I mean, it's not even moving it's not even inter-property commerce. It's right here on my <laughs> land. How could you possibly regulate it? I'm, I'm growing it. I'm consuming it. And the answer was that because you're growing your own wheat, that means you're not purchasing wheat in the interstate market. So by abstaining from purchasing wheat in the interstate market, you are implicitly engaged in interstate commerce and thereby subject to regulation. <laughs> So there goes Madison's, oh, this don't worry about this clause, doesn't really mean much, you know, don't anybody worry. So this, after that, after early 1940s, for the next half century, the Supreme Court did not once challenge the other branches of the federal government on their interpretations of the Commerce Clause. Not one time. They let the federal government get away with all kinds of crazy things on the ground that interstate commerce somehow authorized it. Well, that stopped in 1995. We got this Lopez, U.S. versus Lopez case. In that case, that involved a, a law involving gun-free school zones. Now, there were already 40 states that had gun-free school zone laws, so this seemed to have been pretty well in hand, but the federal government was arguing that it had the right to go and regulate guns in and around schools, and it doesn't matter if you think that's a good idea or not. The point is, is it authorized by the Constitution to, to do this, which would seem to be a state matter. The argument they used, though, to justify it was based on the Commerce Clause. And it went as follows, that if students are afraid that there might be guns in or around their schools, they won't be able to learn as effectively. And if they don't learn as effectively, they're going to wind up ignorant. And if they're ignorant, they won't be as productive, and therefore not as many goods will be produced, and therefore interstate commerce will be lessened. And so the Supreme Court, which is normally pretty indulgent on these things, said that that's a bit much even for us <laughs> and struck that down. <laughs> but a lot of people looked at this and a lot of people who still sort of cling to the idea that we can limit government, they said, aha, finally, 53 years later, the Supreme Court sees the light. But in fact, if you look closely at the case, they don't actually question the substantial effects doctrine. Their argument was that does not substantially affect interstate commerce. But they still kept that rule that if it does, then we can, then we can regulate it. So people started to think this is a new birth of limited government. It was no such thing. Ten years later, and, and, this, and I don't need to just take a case from ten years later, but this is a, a well-known case, there was the medical marijuana case involving uh, Angel Rach. Now, uh, again, a lot of times when you talk about medical marijuana with libertarians, they're argue, they get impatient with this and they say, this is such a small issue you know, why don't we focus more on generally, you know, general legalization questions. But I focus on this because the legal arguments here are so revealing about the nature of the U.S. government that I cannot uh, restrain myself from examining it. In the Rage case, you have a woman, actually initially it was two women, um, 
this is a case that made its way through two lower courts and then to the Supreme Court. In the two lower courts, it actually involved a, a couple of women, and then ultimately it only involved Angel Rach. But these were women who had one condition or another that could be alleviated only by the medicinal use of cannabis. And she and Angel Rach, you know, grew her own plant or, or had people grow plants and then give, give the stuff to her. Or um, Diane Monson grew them herself and whatever. And California had a special law. Uh, the Compassionate Use Act of 1996 that authorized this in cases like this. And if you were to look at all the things wrong with Angel Rach, it, it would just blow your mind. That I mean, this was I mean, she had everything you can imagine, and, and including inoperable tumors. She had a mysterious wasting syndrome that caused her to lose at least a pound a day. So I mean, she would just waste away. She cu she couldn't walk. She had, I mean I, I can't even list them all. I mean we list them in the in the book, but it's unbelievable what this woman went through, and she was told you know what, you know you're going to jail. We can't uh, you you can't do that. So the thing finally went to the Supreme Court. Now it's worth noting that all the so-called liberals on the court, like Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Stephen Breyer, you know liberals they believe in individual liberty, right? You know and conservatives want to <laughs> force the Bible on everybody. That's the caricature, you know. Well, in fact, no, Stephen Breyer was all in favor of, uh, of criminalizing this. Ruth Bader Ginsburg, all, well, well, always, federal government supremacy trumps all other values at all times for liberals on the court. It, it seems to, be, to, to me to be the case. The, the one person who actually took a really principled stand was actually Clarence Thomas, who said that the whole substantial effects test is totally bogus. It's got no history in the, in the, in the Constitution or anything like that. But what's interesting was that Angel Rach was arguing that her rights were being violated by the federal government. And now she's got to reckon with Caroline products, that the federal government is assumed to be right. So she's got to look at footnote four and see, well, how do I show that nevertheless, even though you're assumed to be right, you're, you're actually wrong? Like, how do I even argue that? And the Caroline Products decision, footnote four, says that the only way you can prove your case against the federal government is if the right you are alleging has been violated is a, quote, fundamental right. Well, well you know, fundamental, what's that? Well, the government is going to get to decide that. In later cases, it's, it was later explained to us what a fundamental right is. A fundamental right is one that satisfies two conditions. It must be deeply rooted in this nation's history and traditions. And secondly, it must be implicit in the concept of ordered liberty. So, okay, so they take a completely amorphous, impossible to understand requirement, and then they just add another one. <laughs> so Angel Rach went into court uh, and, and basically made the argument that she is trying to preserve her life and avoid unnecessary pain and suffering. And she says, that seems to me to be deeply rooted in this country's history and traditions. And that seems to be, you know, have something to do with ordered liberty. But here's the problem. What if the court defines the right in question differently? What if the court says, no, we say that the right you're claiming is the right to use marijuana for medical reasons. Now, does that sound like it's deeply rooted in American history and traditions? Does that sound like it is as deeply rooted in ordered liberty? So the problem is now the court can stack the deck against you simply by deciding how it wants to define the right that you're claiming has been violated. So in fact, she walks in there and the court you know, listens patiently and then the decision comes down that uh, yes, we understand. They actually say we, we believe the testimony of her physician that this is the only treatment that will be satisfactory in this case. That everything else that's been tried has had side effects that are even worse. This is the only option she has. We recognize that. But the real right that she's claiming, they said, is the right to smoke marijuana for medical reasons. So we're going to restate her claim that way and then rule. Well, how do you think they ruled? Sorry, you can't do it. In fact, Here's how the case actually reads. Federal law does not recognize a fundamental right to use medical marijuana prescribed by a licensed, licensed physician to alleviate excruciating pain and human suffering. <laughs> Look, they said it, not me, all right? Unbelievable, right? Now, but I don't, nevertheless, when we wrote Who Killed the Constitution, our, our goal was not to say, Look at these crazy Supreme Court justices. What a bunch of jokers. It wasn't to do that, because there are so many books on that. You know, I mean, you could, you know, you could build a little fort out of them. 
you know? So we say, yes, you know, there are a lot of crummy Supreme Court justices, but, you know, it's not like these Supreme Court justices, you know, just drop from the sky onto the bench. Who put them there? The other two, two crummy branches, right? So we want to show that all three branches in collusion have pretty much overturned the Constitution. It's not just these, these crummy justices. And in this specific case, we see all three branches doing their dirty work. Because, okay, you got the, the crummy decision in 2005, but then you have, you know, so that's the, the judicial branch. But the executive branch, of which the DEA, the drug enforcement folks, are actually just a, you know, a subsidiary part of the executive branch. They're the ones whose raids on these people started the whole thing in the first place. So there's the executive branch. But then the legislative branch bears a certain share of responsibility as well. Nine days after the Raich decision came out, Congress refused for the third year in a row to approve a measure that would have prohibited the Justice Department from expending any funds in the prosecution of cases like, like this one. So all three branches are, are responsible. And so we don't just have, you know, so we, we're looking at crummy presidents, crummy congressmen, they're all crummy is basically our, our, our message. Because if you look at the legislative branch, how many congressmen, okay, I know, you already know the answer is one. <laughs> but, but how many congressmen, you know, sit awake at night thinking, I just don't see any constitutional authorization for what it is I want to do. Like, it doesn't even <laughs> remote, I mean, they would laugh at that. It doesn't even remotely occur to them to think this way. If we want to bail out some crummy bank or some institution or whatever, and we've got a majority vote here in the Congress, then we're just going to do it. Like, it does not even occur to them that there's any limitation on their power. I mean, a common example of this is we all remember the Prohibition Amendment. In fact, I was in D.C. Some of you know the Prohibition Amendment is the 18th Amendment. You know, you can't, no selling alcohol or, or having fun. I think they struck out the having fun part at the last minute. Get some of the states to ratify, but but I was in this hotel in D.C., and they actually have a bar. It's called the 21st Amendment Cafe, which is the, which is the amendment, of course, that overturned prohibition. So that, that, that's good fun. But you notice that they did that with a constitutional amendment. They realized, well, you know, we don't want people drinking, but, you know, the federal government has no authorization to do that, so we better amend the Constitution. Whereas today, if they wanted to do that again, you think they would amend the Constitution? They'd just do it. Like, it wouldn't even occur to them. I mean, even in the war on drugs, for example, I mean, as many of you know, in, you know, 1937 was when you started to get, um, uh, you know, this, the war on marijuana specifically. But even that wasn't an outright prohibition. It was just imposing absurdly high taxes on these substances so that if you got caught with them, it wasn't possession per se, it was tax evasion. Because there's no way you paid taxes on this. We know that. We made it impossible. <laughs> That's why we did it. But then around 1969 to 70, they, we get the, con the Controlled Substances Act that just says, you know what, we're just going to ban all these things. Well, okay, well, what changed between, you know, prohibition and, and now that suddenly you can just do that by legislative fiat? Well, nothing other than they just don't want to bother anymore. But the executive branch, oh, I could linger lovingly on this one because there's, there's just so much to despise here, you know, and... <laughs> We've got so many people, and you know, I'm happy that people don't like the current president. I was happy that people didn't like the previous one, uh, you know, and so on and on. And in fact, I'll, I'll never forget uh, one of my favorite Lou Rockwell lines it was from maybe 10 years ago, and he said that, that his greatest hope was that Bill Clinton would be the last president of the United States. You know, like that would, that the whole institution would somehow <laughs> go away. But, um, but my point, the point that we make in this book is that Gosh, to just focus on George W. Bush, I mean, there's a, a, an embarrassment of riches there, to be sure, but gosh, you're missing out on so much 20th century goodies, you know? I mean, there's so much to dig out here to just focus on him. And it turns out that so many people who are anti-George Bush, well, they, they love presidents who uh, basically did largely the same thing. And these are presidents that we're all taught to admire and love in our, in our textbooks. Well, specifically... One of the instruments that the executive branch has used to circumvent the Constitution is the executive order, which is a directive issued by the president that requires no consent from Congress. Now, strictly speaking, that's not in and of itself unconstitutional. The president, for example, has the constitutional authority to pardon people, and he can pardon people by executive order. But there's always the temptation to do other things by executive order, like pass a law that he doesn't think he could get through Congress. 
Well, he's, of course, not authorized to pass a law. That's why he's in the executive branch. But what's to stop him from doing it? And in fact, we've seen this done over and over again. In the 90s, that crummy Paul Begala, who was an aide to uh, Bill Clinton, said he was so excited about the executive order because he said, and this, these are his exact words, stroke of the pen, law of the land, kind of cool. Kind of cool. I don't know. I just feel like someday when the revolution comes, people like this are going to have to be in the dock somewhere. Okay, I mean, Not executed necessarily, but they're going to have to answer for themselves. But for example, for example, one of my favorite executive orders, and you might think I'm just cherry picking here. Well, maybe I am. It's my freaking speech. Okay, but is Franklin Roosevelt during World War II issues an executive order it's the Franklin Roosevelt Tax Simplification Executive Order, as, as I refer to it, because it says that from now on, the top income tax rate for incomes over $25,000 is 100%. So it's simple, right? You just mail it in. No complicated forms to fill out. So the Congress, though, later overrode this and said, now, wait a minute. If you're going to take away every dollar people earn over 25000 they're not going to produce all the war goods that we need. You're like, we're in a war here. So it was mostly for that reason that they decided, you know, not so much for the, hey, you're stealing from people, you probably shouldn't do that. It was the, we can't, the state can't carry out its ends as effectively if you, if you do that. Well, whatever the reason is, at least they, they got rid of that. Well, one of the points that I've made a lot of times is that Typically, and, and I'm, here I'm following up on Ralph Rako, anytime you hear that a politician is beloved, <laughs> you know this is bad news, right? You know this is bad news. It's like any time I, I interviewed Tom DiLorenzo uh, this afternoon for this, this sort of uh, internet broadcast thing that I do, and we were talking about Lincoln. And here's an area, you know, where Newt Gingrich and Hillary Clinton are just as enthusiastic about him as anybody. They're both, they both and I said to him, you know you are getting to the heart of the regime when you have narrowed it down to things that they all love and wave incense before. You know, that you know you're getting to the core of things. Well, likewise, Teddy Roosevelt is supposed to be the president we all love, you know, because he's, like he's like a man's man and he goes on safaris and he's got teeth the size of my head. <laughs> this is supposed to be great. But Teddy Roosevelt had this philosophy of the presidency that argued that uh, there were two, two basic uh, planks of it. One of them is that the president, the executive branch, can do whatever it is not prohibited from doing in the Constitution. So kind of turning the thing on its head. And then secondly, he says, I, the president, I'm the only elected office. I, I occupy the only elected office that all Americans vote for. That, you know, a senator, well, people from one state vote for the senator. But the president, all Americans vote for president. And so I am the unique representative of the American people, therefore. And so it's my responsibility to carry out the will of the people. Even if that means overriding the Congress, I have got to get the people's will done. And of course, you know, every demagogue speaks that way in history. They've all spoken that way. I'm just carrying out the people's will. You know, don't look at me. I'm just doing what they want. Um, and so, you know, so there are time after time uh, he would do crazy things. You know, he, he, he threatens the coal miners and the coal, and he uh, pardon me, the coal um, uh, owners, the owners of the mines, in a uh, in the during the coal strike in 1902, and people are saying, you know, because he was threatening to take over the mines, have the army take over the mines. People said, well, where does the Constitution authorize that? And he says, to hell with the Constitution when people want coal. And everybody thinks, yeah, there, there's a man of the people, and he was actually instructing his subordinates that you are on my notice to take over the coal mines, regardless of what you are told to the contrary by anybody else. And, and again, you know, people are trying to make constitutional objections uh, to him. And he says, look, the Constitution was made for the people, not the people for the Constitution. So every time something of significance comes up, he just invents some slogan, some demagogue-type slogan, and, and, and pe people just love it. They just go berserk for it. But one particular thing that was suited to TR, of course, is the executive order, right? Because that's a way the president can do what the people demand without having to listen to a bunch of crummy congressmen. So when you look in the 19th century, how many executive orders are these presidents issuing? I mean, I know, I know we all oftentimes sit around and reflect on the administration of Chester A. Arthur. So we probably know offhand that he issued, you know, no executive orders, you know, or Benjamin Harrison issued three executive orders, you know. But then you get to, to Teddy Roosevelt, and he issues over a thousand of them. 
because this is his philosophy of the presidency. That's who he is. So there's one example where he wants this treaty with the Dominican Republic to pass, but the Senate doesn't seem to like it. So he decides that instead of you know, renegotiating the treaty, whatever, taking this under advisement, uh, instead of that, he decides, let's just not call it a treaty. We'll just say it's an executive agreement, which is like a foreign policy analog to the executive order. It's just an agreement between me and the Dominican Republic. And that's what he did, and he just passed it. And, and I used to have students, and you know, God loved them for, the, for their, their innocence, you know, but they used to say to me, is he allowed to do that? <laughs> so, yeah. Well, he did it, right? Isn't that the important thing? The, the guy did it. So before saying a little, there's a little something about George W. Bush. I mean, we have George W. Bush in the title of the book. You know, it's the fate of American liberty from World War I to George W. Bush. We did that basically because we thought, by 2008, people are just going to be ready to commit atrocities every time they hear the name George W. Bush. So we have to make sure people know that he's, he's targeted in here. But before we get to that, just a brief thing about my, one of my favorite presidents, and I say that sarcastically, Harry Truman. Now, Harry Truman, you should all listen to Ralph Rako's lecture on Harry Truman on Mises Org or, or look, him up, uh, look it up on Lou Rockwell uh, when he wrote it out because it's absolutely excellent. But Harry Truman expressly held these same views. I mean, he came out and said, you know, I'm the unique representative of the American people. I can do anything I'm not prohibited from doing. He had exactly the same philosophy of the presidency. And Harry Truman is the guy we're all, as a president, we're basically taught to admire. He's one of the good guys. As a matter of fact, um, most of you are not old enough to remember the election of 1988. <laughs> Good for you. But in the election of 1988, it was, it was George Bush, the father, against Mike Dukakis, the Massachusetts governor. And the funny thing about that election was each one of those two men, as they stumped around the country, each one of them was trying to see, they were both competing to see which one of them could be more like Harry Truman. They were both, you know, hey, look, look at me. I'm just like Truman because I'm doing this or that. And, no, I'm Truman. Truman had the lowest approval ratings ever of any president ever since they started polling on this matter when he left office. And that's what they're competing to be. Could I, who can be the most hated guy? I mean, it's just amazing to me that you would want to appeal to this guy. Well, anyway, so Truman, during the Korean War, 1952, there's a, there's a threatened uh, steel strike. So Truman just seizes the steel mills. We, we, we tell this uh, story in the book. He just seizes the steel mills. And uh, so, of course, the owners of the steel mills thought this was, uh, you know, uncalled for. And <laughs> so, you know, it, it just seemed like stealing to them, basically. So the thing wound up going to um, a lower court and a federal court. And a federal judge, in fact, wound up questioning the assistant attorney general. Now, probably you've not heard of, of the Assistant Attorney General under Harry Truman, Holmes Baldridge. But Holmes Baldridge was not really prepared for Judge Pine, who asked him, having heard what the Assistant Attorney General was saying about the powers of the President, he said, is it your view that the Constitution limits the power of the judiciary and the legislature, but not the executive? And his answer was, that, that is how we read the Constitution. And by the way, that's how, that's how the Bush administration reads it. That's how John Yoo, who, who was uh, in the Justice Department for, for several years, that's absolutely how he reads it. That Article 2 is just a, a, you know, an expansive uh, power that really authorizes just about anything the executive wants to do that's been traditionally held to be some kind of executive power. So then the judge said to the Assistant Attorney General in 1952, he said, um, do you mean to say to me that if the president authorized one of his subordinates to take you into custody and execute you in the morning, you would have no way to enjoin him from doing this. And the response came, I'll have to think that one over. <laughs> All righty. <laughs> well, the, the Supreme Court did overturn the, the steel mill seizure, but, but actually very, very weakly. It's that, you know, the, 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 the Youngstown case is supposed to be this fantastic, wonderful decision. It's actually a very weak decision, and, and it actually seems that it was public opinion that was against the, the steel mill seizure that actually turned the tide, that otherwise they would have just gone along with it. Yeah, sure, the government can seize property because it's the government. But after that, of course, you've got Truman. He did this, by the way, because he says he's the commander-in-chief of the armed forces. That authorizes him to take the steel mills. You know, fi figure that, do the math on that one. But, but, of course, that means that his views on war powers are not difficult to discern. Uh, he says that because he's the commander-in-chief, he can send however many hundreds of thousands of Americans overseas to go fight in Korea without consulting anyone. 
He can do that because he's the commander in chief and because the United Nations authorized the war. So, you know, why should he have to consult some mere congressman, you know, when he's got the diplomats of the UN to, to, to back him up? And this now seems normal to people, that presidents do this a lot and whatever, and there's, there's nothing unusual about it. But it was unusual until 1950. You do not see this being done in American history, regardless of the neoconservative claim that hundreds of cases of this can be found in American history. That is a huge lie. Uh, I talk about that in my 33 Questions book, and I think a little bit in here. And it's just a total lie. There, there, no, there aren't. When you actually look at these alleged examples, it's like five soldiers chasing three Mexican cattle rustlers over the border. <laughs> and they're counting that as a military intervention that c Congress was not consulted about. Well, I, I think that's rather different from trying to, you, you know, invade North Korea, which they did in part of the, try, they wanted to do it during part of that war. But nevertheless, that's Truman's view. Well, who stood up to him was Senator Robert Taft, who was an old right con uh, senator who said, uh, you know, this is not, the, not historically correct. It's, there's no precedent for this. And who stood up and, and opposed Taft? It was the liberal historians of the day defending Harry Truman, the Democrat. It was Henry Steele Commager and Arthur Schlesinger, Jr., Arthur Schlesinger's work, by the way, should never be read. It is an utter waste of time. Especially his work on Andrew Jackson. Trying to make Andrew Jackson, who had his flaws. I, 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 look, I'm not a supporter of Andrew Jackson. But by and large, he did more or less believe in a free economy. Try to make Andrew Jackson out to be the forerunner of the New Deal. I'm not kidding. That was on my general exam uh, as an undergrad to, at, when I was going for, uh, for honors. Uh, you had to take a written exam, and, and one of the questions was, uh, you know, do you think there's a link between the 30s, Jacksonian democracy, and the New Deal of the 1930s? <laughs> I said, as a matter of fact, I don't, and, and here, here are the reasons. And, and I actually did really well on that exam, so, uh, so you know, so the, the evidence is, is, is staring you right in the face. Well, all the same, all the same. Um, what this boils down to, though, is that there will always be people willing to make in effect, to weave defenses of presidential and other exertions of power that are not authorized by the Constitution. If it's Truman, then it'll be the, the historians on the left. And then when it's Bush, it'll be, historian, it'll be scholars on the right, like John Yoo, who teaches at Berkeley, who will come up with all these rationales as to why the president is perfectly entitled to do everything that he's doing. This is not surprising. This is how it works. This is what it means to be a court historian. You do what the regime wants. Well, what we've seen, though, is that these, these powers of the president to go to war have now got, have gotten to the point where in the 1990s, in 1999, Bill Clinton actually bombed the Serbs even in the face of a congressional, resol a, a congressional refusal to support the bombing, which would seem to me that would be an impeachable offense instead of the, uh, you know, the, the other thing that they wound up, they wound up uh, talking about. We then have this problem. Now, I've talked about this guy, John Yu. He was like a, one of these guys whose title has got 12 words. It's like the assistant to the assistant deputy, assistant attorney general sort of thing in the Bush administration in the first term. But he's a legal scholar who's written an awful lot about the powers of the president in war and the powers of the president in our constitutional structure. And you is one of the scholars who it is very widely believed was responsible for basically saying that the president can wiretap people without consulting Congress and in fact going against Congress's directives he's free to do that so you has such an expansive view of the powers of the president that he was asked in a debate are you saying that the president could order uh, the torture of people um, even you know even even contrary to congressional directives on the subject and 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 there would be no way to stop him. And, and you said, yeah, you know, I, I do believe that. And they said, so are you saying that if the president thought that the best way to torture somebody was to take that person aside, find his son, and crush his son's testicles, the president could do that? And you responded, I think it would depend on why the president felt he needed to do that. So that was the, that's supposed to reassure us that if he doesn't have a good reason for, for the testicle crushing, we're not going <laughs> to let him get away with it. And by the way, a lot of this ties into this signing statements issue. Some of you have probably heard of this. This is basically a Bush administration innovation, although you see them here and there, but they never had any real significance. The signing statement is this sort of statement that is issued alongside the signing of a bill, but it's typically not issued at the time. 
So in other words, when a bill is signed, you know, you've got the whatever the bill is, you've got the troop of Girl Scouts there smiling as the president is signing the bill. You've got this or that government hack in the background grinning like a sap. But <laughs> the signing statement is usually just put in some, you know, in the federal registry, like some, some, you know, registry of documents and usually not even read. But the signing statement is the president's chance, and that's what uh, has happened under this administration, where there have been more provi legislative provisions challenged through signing statements than in all ad other administrations put together, where the president can say, you know, he, this, particular asp this particular part of this legislation, I'm not going to enforce that. Or this particular thing, I, I interpret it this way even though you probably interpreted it that way. So, for instance, there's a defense appropriations bill that said, look, no money set aside in this bill is to be spent on any type of offensive operation in Colombia between the government and the rebels. That is, I mean, you could, if, if there's some defensive uh, measure necessary, that's one thing, but it does not authorize any offensive measure. And the signing statement said that uh, the, the administration interprets this clause as being advisory in nature. <laughs> So, you know, uh, we'll, we'll, listen, we'll consider this, but uh, if we feel like doing what we want to do, we're just going to go ahead with that. That's, the, that's more or less the situation. That's, 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 what we, that's what we face. And even areas where you think, you know, you may think, all right, maybe some of what I've said involves constitutional clauses that are somehow unclear. I, I don't think so. Maybe that you could argue that. But you would at least think the First Amendment freedom of speech thing was clear enough. You know, freedom of speech is clear enough in the Constitution, and yet, just to give one example, my favorite, of course, during World War I, you've got people being thrown in jail for writing articles and giving speeches. And you even had such hysteria against the Germans that there were voluntary organizations founded in the United States to help enforce sedition legislation, to, to root out people who were disloyal or making disloyal comments about the war. So you actually had a group called the terrible threateners. <laughs> and it was your job to make your neighbors uncomfortable if they said anything about the war. There was another group called the sedition slammers. I mean, this is like way worse than freedom fries, right? That, you know, it's nothing compared to this. But then my favorite, because it's just so Bolshevik, the boy spies of America. <laughs> How does this happen? Now, in this speech I gave in D.C. a few weeks ago, I pointed out that uh, poor Eugene Debs, you know, I don't agree with him on much, um, but, he, but on the great moral question of the day, he was right. He was against the war. And he gave a speech being against the war. And it was, a, it was, it, it was partly a good speech. I mean, some of this, it's a lot of socialist boilerplate, uh, but, but part of it was a pretty good speech. So he was imprisoned for years for this. And... Petitions kept coming into Woodrow Wilson to free him, and every one of them he just wrote, denied. No way am I letting this guy out. So, of course, it was Warren Harding, Wilson's successor, who, who let Eugene Debs out. And Harding is one of these uh, presidents all the historians hate because, uh, because, you know, Wilson, at the end of Wilson's term, there's a big depression, you know, because of all the, you know, all the, uh, the, the credit bubble and incre or increase in the money supply and the war and everything. There's this big depression, and... You know, Warren Harding doesn't do a thing about it, and it goes away. I mean, historians hate that. They hate that. You know, by the time it even occurred to him that maybe something ought to be done, the thing was over. And it was a worse downturn, actually, than, um, you know, in terms of a lot of the statistics, than, than actually the, than the Great Depression. So they, they hate Harding. The fact that not only was he doing nothing, you know, he's smoking, he's drinking during the Depression, during a Prohibition, you know, he's playing poker. He's doing some things in the White House that maybe... You know, a chaste man wouldn't do, but that's a whole other matter. But here's this simple America. You know, as recently as the 1920s, you could knock on the White House door and Warren Harding would answer. It's hard, it's hard to imagine the, the pre-imperial U.S., you know, that this was possible before, you know, he's got legions of people. Or you, you'd get, you know, mowed down if you so much as looked, looked at him the wrong way. But anyway, so poor Eugene Debs was finally released, you know, on the, you know and, and, and Harding said, I wanted him to have his Christmas dinner with his wife. You know, just a simple, humane, non-ideological response to this situation. Well, Eugene Debs, sitting in there, unjustly imprisoned, runs for president from prison. How can you not love this guy? <laughs> he runs for president, he gets a million votes from prison, and... 
He had a, a campaign button that said, for president, convict number 9653. <laughs> that is a beauty. I've got to look this thing up on eBay, if that's still around. But anyway, ladies and gentlemen, what I'll leave you with, so we at least have a, a couple minutes for questions. I know it's so hot in here, and I'm sure they've got the air conditioning cranked, but there's only so much you can do. Just leave you with this little thought by Lysander Spooner, which was, Lysander Spooner acknowledged that, yes, you know, the big government in our day, you know, Spooner's writing the 1860s and 70s, you know, he's talking about big government in our day, you know, <laughs> and he's saying that, you know, I recognize, he said, that probably the Constitution does not authorize a lot of what the government is doing. So to some limited degree, the Constitution is blameless, you know, but he said, you know, either, we either have two options, though, here, either the Constitution does authorize this huge government we see around us, or it has been unable to stop it. And either way, it is unfit to exist. And so for those of you who have been on my case for talking about the Constitution, I leave you with that radical thought, and I hope you're satisfied. <laughs>